Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever you're checking this out, church, uh, we wanna say welcome. Uh, we wanna say, how are you doing? <laughs> we wanna make sure that everything is good. Uh, we don't take these times lightly when we get to spend these moments here together, uh, looking to God, uh, looking to grow as a community, uh, looking to learn more and more of who we are as we learn more of who God is. Uh, so today we're excited. Uh, the vibe's a little bit different in here, uh, but we do pray this, that whatever may be happening in your life in this season, uh, regardless of difficulty or regardless of joy and great times, uh, that we would be reminded God is good always and God is with us always. So I wanna pray uh, before we jump into this series and get things going, uh, I pray uh, that I won't be before you too long this morning, but that we would be encouraged, uh, we would be pushed towards growth uh, and healthier, more God, Christ-like lives uh, through this time we spend here together. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, you can bow your head, you can stare straight at me, whatever works, let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you so much um, for being good, for being God, for being holy, for being who you are. Uh, we pray that as we seek to spend these moments here together on this Sunday, might you uh, truly just show us how much your presence is with us. Remind us of your great love. Remind us of the intentionality you have for each one of our lives. God, I pray that as our scriptures, are, your scriptures are open this morning, might our hearts be opened in response. I thank you for these people on the other side of this screen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, folks who may be asking questions to uh, determine if they want to be closer to you, if you're even real. God, whatever is needed, might you provide an answer. Uh, we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Say it with me. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. So uh, as I mentioned, the vibe's a little different, uh, but I hope you get to see this, that the goal of what we want to do in this next series, which is revisiting an old series, but something that can never be outdated or old, is this. We want to focus attention on <laughs> nothing else around me, Nothing else around you, but just Jesus himself. We cannot talk about Jesus enough. Uh, we cannot focus enough on who he is. Uh, the, the problem when it comes to our everyday lives and even when it comes to churches, uh, there's so many additional things that we want to put on the table before people. We wanna uh, make things more attractive. We wanna uh, you know, uh, build uh, better music and have uh, more community. We wanna um, ask people what they want. We send out surveys and all of these things have a place. But at the end of the day, if everything else is pushed off the table, if everything else we don't receive and all we get is just Jesus, will it be enough? Throughout this series, uh, we're gonna explore this in a number of different ways. Uh, and the goal and why we set it up like this is we desire for it to be personal because Jesus's intention of coming to this earth is that God in bodily form would encounter mankind and mankind would encounter God in bodily form and our stories would intersect with one another. And at that intersection, we see what happens. And that's the goal of what I intend to do here today. Um, so as we get into this, um, the, 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 the main premise, the main thought is this, that there's one question and I really do love this setup. So, uh, you know, shout out uh, Rodney and Shayla, your pastor's getting real creative here. Uh, there's one main question, and I feel like this is, you know, an interrogation room. It's me and the camera, uh, but you guys are on the other side of the camera. So it's me and you here together this morning or evening or whenever. Uh, and I keep saying one question, then I keep talking about other stuff. But the one question is this. If I were to stare you dead in your face and ask you, who are you? How would you respond? This, this question uh, raises a great deal of discomfort. I know even for myself, when, when posed such a question, who are you? It makes me think of caveats. It makes me think of, okay, who am I uh, in a professional sense, in a personal sense, in a creative sense, in a, I'm a man, I'm, I'm this, I'm from PG County, uh, uh, my, my family's from Nigeria, but who are you? Identity at the core of who we are. This is the most significant question we can ever wrestle with. 
And this question was posed to Jesus amongst his disciples. And that's where we're going to visit here in the scriptures. But uh, I want to share a little bit of who I am. So I, I had this picture I wanted to put on the screen. Uh, my wife laughs at it. It, it. I laugh at it when I see it as well. But uh, this picture, it, it, it really makes me go back to my childhood days when we were first confronted with this question of identity, when we're placed around friends in school, when we uh, begin to be socialized around our cousins, around other family members, and we formulate the basis of our identity. When I look at this picture, what I see is uh, a question. <laughs> People say that I ask questions with my eyebrows, like, oh, is everything okay? I see the discomfort I had. I see the insecurity in, in just being myself. I see uh, a, a, a longing for acceptance. I see a hooper as well, right? No, like I, if only I had confidence when I played basketball, but you know, I, I had some good times. Or, you know, I'm a pure athlete by nature, uh, but I think the thing that held me back even on the basketball court and in all avenues of my life is I would enter a room and I would try to assimilate and see, will people accept me for who I am or do I need to be someone else? Is it okay for me to be myself? And that is a, a, a bad foundation for forming identity is to be looking to shape shift to be like those around you. But as I encountered Jesus, I believe this, he began to speak directly to my identity. And I met Jesus, I would say, when I was about five years old at a summer camp, uh, a summer day camp. So, uh, you know, you're never too young or, or don't uh, uh, despise what it means to go to, you know, these summer camps over the summer. But meeting Jesus, it wasn't like I snapped my fingers and my identity was changed and I was no longer shy and timid and this scared little boy. Uh, but in the gradual progression, as God revealed himself to me, my identity was revealed to myself as well. So let's go to the scriptures. Uh, and I want us to walk through this main portion of scripture here this morning with, the, with, with, with this question in mind. Who are you? As you look in the mirror and before you prepare to go to bed, hopefully brushing your teeth. You know what I'm saying? A little bit of floss is always helpful. Uh, some mouthwash to kill the germs and gingivitis. But when you look in that mirror, who are you? There, there, there's nothing that can uh, uh, be of more supreme importance than for us to have a core understanding of who we are and who God has called us to be. Um, so as we enter the scriptures here, we're going to Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to start at verse number 13, Matthew 16, 13 says this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? Who do people say the son of man is? So this first question, as I mentioned, who are you? Jesus walks in, he's talking to his folks and he says, man, what's the word on the street? What do people have to say about my identity? How do people perceive me when I'm not there? Uh, this reminds me, I don't know if you've ever been on a job interview, they'll raise this question and say, uh, what would your teammates say to describe you or to describe the experience of working with you? And of course, all of us would say, you know, I'm, I'm a great person. I'm a great teammate. I'm the best ever. But when you're not in a room, what do you actually think people say about you? This is kind of the, the pulse that Jesus is taking with the disciples. Who do people say that the son of man is? We go to verse 14. It says this. They answer. Well, they replied. Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. So we see there's always a number, a multiplicity of answers to who Jesus is when we stare at his identity. And I believe this from back in biblical times to the modern day when people are confronted with the question of who Jesus is, there will always be multiple answers. But at the end of the day, just as in a multiple choice question being posed on a test, there's only one right answer to who Jesus is. And let's look even further into these scriptures as we describe and we define. And I offer you the truth that I believe and I ask you to wrestle with it. Who is Jesus to you today? 
Um, I, I, I love what they say in verse 14. They start naming some names. They're saying, man, he's like John the Baptist or you're Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But I wanted to zoom in on their first answer. John the Baptist who was actually Jesus's cousin. So Jesus was not his cousin. They're two distinct people. But I love when they answer, when, when, when they pose this answer of what the crowds, what the people are saying about Jesus's identity. And it drew me to another scripture. If we jump to John, this is uh, not John the Baptist who we're about to talk about, uh, but John the disciple uh, in John chapter three, verse 26. And then we're going to read verses 28 through 31. And, and, and these verses came to mind when they say he's John the Baptist. I wanted us to look and, and get this from the horse's mouth. Who was John the Baptist, right? So John 3, 26 says, so John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah is also baptizing people. And everybody is going to him instead of coming to us. So John the Baptist, his disciples are, are, are beginning to set this competitive landscape. Uh, they're saying, who's going to baptize the most people? Everybody's going over there. This reminds me uh, of what it's like in the modern day church landscape saying, oh, I'm competing with the church down the street. Oh, they're going over there. Or, oh, man, they got the popping IG or, hey, you want to go there? Uh, this is a sidebar from the sermon. We are not in competition with our own family. We cannot be in competition if we're shooting at the same basket. I have to speak to myself and ask, why am I fighting with my brother when Jesus is asking us to be united and move in the same direction? There is no competition if we're on the same team. So to be reminded of the fact the church is Jesus's. So whether you decide to be committed to one shot or you decide to be committed to the church up the street, a church in a different city. The goal is this. We are one body, one family. It is the, the, the role of you as a disciple. If you call yourself a follower of Christ is to be committed and planted to a church that teaches the Bible so that you might learn more about who God has called you to be on the same team. But we see here the disciples were talking about they, he's baptizing. We're not baptizing people going over there. They're not coming here. And we jump down to verse 28. It says, you yourselves know how plainly I told you, I am not the Messiah. I am only here to, to, to prepare the way for him. This mindset of John the Baptist, he clearly answers this question for anyone who, who, who would have been, who caused the disciples to say, some say you're John the Baptist. John made it clear, I am not the Messiah. If, if we sat John the Baptist down in this chair and we asked him about his identity, I love this. He's clear on who he is. He's clear on why he came. I am not the Messiah. I am here to prepare the way for him. Verse 29, it is the bridegroom who marries the bride. <laughs> Good words. You know, I just got married not too long ago. So this analogy is very fitting for me. You know what I'm saying? Wearing the ring, rocking the ring. It feels good now. We're getting more acclimated. But he says it is the bridegroom who marries the bride and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. G John the Baptist is talking about Jesus. He says, no, no, no. It would, it, it, it would be the same analogy as on my wedding day. I had, I had nine groomsmen standing with me. Pastor Rodney standing with me, my brother standing with me. And, and to realize this, that on that day of me getting married, I was supposed to stand out. The attention was not supposed to be on my friends who were standing with me. And they all understood that and did a great job of making me feel special and making me be present in the reality. This is my day. But the same position that they were in is what God is calling us to be in, that we are not the bridegroom. This is not our big day. It never will be. Jesus will always be first. He will always come first. And I love this verse 30. John makes it clear. He says, I'm not the Messiah. I'm here to prepare a way for him. I'm not the bridegroom. I'm simply support. I, I'm filled with joy because he is successful. Not at my success. I get joy from Jesus being successful. And verse 30 says he must become greater and greater and I must become less and less. 
what a what a what a opposite or a opposing mindset to how so many of us feel to how I feel on the daily basis. Jesus must become greater and greater and I must become less and less. The exact opposite is what happens so many times. I'm seeking the attention. I'm seeking to build my, my, my brand, my, my, to build more resources, to build more attention, to build my kingdom. John the Baptist is saying Jesus must become greater and greater and I must become less and less. And we see verse 31, John chapter 3, he has come from above and is greater than anyone else. This is the perspective. Now, when we sit down and we ask Jesus, who are you? John is answering. He's saying, man, he must become greater. He is from above and he's greater than anyone else. We, me, me, we, we are of the earth and we speak of earthly things, but he has come from heaven and is greater than anyone else. And, and I love these uh, sentiments. I love these verses. And there's this one quote. Uh, there's this one quote about Jesus, about his identity, about who he is, about framing this perspective of, of knowing this, that uh, we can never esteem Christ, esteem Jesus high enough. If you think about him and say, man, that's man, I think of Jesus so highly. We can never think of him high enough. We we can only seek to esteem him greater and greater. And and there's this this quote I pulled from a commentary as I was studying. It says this, it says, note, it is possible for men to have good thoughts of Christ and yet not right ones. You see that? That's what I was saying. There's a multiple choice and, and many people are filling in blanks. Jesus is this. Jesus is just a prophet. You will hear many people who may ascribe to the Islamic faith will say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. He was a good prophet. He was a good man. So that's one choice. You'll see some people say, yeah, Jesus was just a man. He just walked the earth. You'll see some people say uh, Jesus wasn't God, though. He was just a, 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 a guy who could do miracles. He had God like features. But you see, this this quote says it is possible for men to have good thoughts of Christ and yet not right ones a high opinion of him and yet not high enough to know this we can think good of Jesus we can think highly of Jesus but the goal the reminder that John the Baptist set that we see from scriptures is it's not high enough the thoughts you think about him are not good enough. Jesus is far greater and always will be greater. Let's continue on down this road. We're jumping back to our main scripture, which was in Matthew chapter 16. And we saw Jesus asked them, who do you, who do people say I am? They said John the Baptist. They said a oh, good prophet. And then in verse 15, we see a transition. Jesus again says, he asked them, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? And I love to build out the contrast. At first, Jesus asked, who do people say I am? So that's informal. That's at a distance. He's asking the disciples to speak about others. And then now he brings it much closer and he looks them in their faces. I, I assume it would be as me looking at this camera and you looking directly in my eyes. Uh, Jesus is saying, who do you say I am? And, and this is the question I want to sit in your lap here this morning, evening, whenever you're checking out this content. Who do you say that Jesus is? I believe that that is one of the primary questions that will be the determining factor in your entire life. You can never put enough significance on this one question. Who do you say that Jesus is? Verse 16, Simon answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, the son of the living God. And I love this when, when, when we see it, that um, there's this transition point. And I believe that's what Jesus played out where we may know Jesus from a distance. Who do other people say that he is? And I will speak about my own life here. When I think about my story of encountering Jesus, I encountered him first off of the faith of my parents, 
off of the faith of parents who would send me to Sunday school or would go to church on Sunday and I would sit there and I would encounter Jesus off of the faith of uh, faithful teachers who would sit up in front of a class and teach me or teach me about Bible verses or pastors I had growing up. I encountered secondhand faith that many times, but I would say it started when I was five. It continued through up until the day I am right now being 33, that Jesus was transitioning me from encountering him off the faith of others to him looking me straight in my face and saying, who do you say that I am? Not who does your mother say I am, not who does your other family members or those leaders at your church or your pastor, but who do you say that I am? And I would say that question began to resonate with me in about middle school, seventh or eighth grade. When, when, when I was transitioning to go to a new school and you know, when you go to a new school, you can switch your entire identity. Nobody knew who you were. <laughs> Nobody knows your family. Nobody knows anything. You can be a new person. And at that very moment, God looked me in the face. Jesus looked me in the face, not literally. <laughs> I'm talking figuratively here. And he said, are you going to be one person that goes to church and is one guy on these days around these church people and then seek to be someone else who fits in at school, who, who says what everyone says at school, who does what everyone does at school? Or will you be consistently who I've called you to be? I think at that point was when it moved from the faith of others into who do I say that Jesus is now? The question for you is when did that transition happen? Has that transition happened? When you were living on the faith of others to now moving into a personal encounter with Jesus saying, who do you say that I am? And I love, we see Simon's answer. His answer as he speaks in, in, in verse 16, we can just brush past that and we say, oh, the Messiah. You know, maybe that's a Christmas word. Maybe maybe it's something we only talk about sometimes. The son of the living God, of course, we 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 grow up in church or we encounter church communities enough and we just brush past Messiah, the son of God. Of course, that's who Jesus is. But the heaviness, the the significance of these words in the Jewish culture may not resonate the same as they do now. But I, I, I hope to do it some justice when they say Messiah. This is a, a, a promised savior that was coming to save an entire group of people from the wrath of God and, and, and from a demeaned position on this earth. The Messiah was someone who was promised from the very day when sin entered into this world and Adam and Eve, there was a separation. There was a division between us and God. And then prophets that came from the Old Testament, they continued to say there is a Messiah coming. There's someone coming who's going to save the day. There's there's someone who's coming like Superman He's going to put that cape on. He's going to swoop in and he's going to defeat the enemy and he's going to bring you and God back together. The Messiah, the anointed one, meaning he is designated. His identity is set apart for a particular purpose. Uh, we talk a lot about anointing. If you grow up in church and people putting hands and oil on heads and all types of wonderful stuff, you walk out to church, you know what I'm saying? Smelling like someone fried chicken on you, all this oil going around and anointing. But the, the one purpose I wanted to share about anointing and Jesus being the Messiah or the anointed one was when the next king would come uh, back in, 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 in the time of the Jews in the Old Testament days, when the next king would come, his position, his role, and his identity would be signified by an anointing of oil to set him apart and to affirm that this is his position. By calling Jesus the Messiah, we are saying you are the anointed one. You are the one who is set apart by God to be the savior of this entire world. There's only one person who could fulfill that job description. It's just Jesus himself. That's what we're going to talk about this whole series. The anointed one, just Jesus himself as our king who will reign forever. His reign does not come to an end. He will reign forever. The son of the living God, God in the flesh, just Jesus himself. So I ask you today. 
As, as we look at this question, transitioning from who do other people say Jesus is to who do you say that Jesus is? And then I want us to see the results of an appropriate or an accurate answer to this question. Who do you say that Jesus is? Simon said the Messiah, the son of the living God. And I love this. Verse 17, Jesus replied, you are blessed. Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you, you did not learn this from any human being. An appropriate answer to who Jesus is only comes from God himself revealing it to you. You can't take secondhand information to get to the truth of who Jesus is. I can talk to you till we're black. We don't really turn blue in the face, so I don't know. I don't know what that analogy would be. I can talk to you till I run out of breath, but only God himself can reveal to you the truth of who Jesus is. May I not look to exalt myself higher or higher or to think, man, this sermon is the one that's going to show them who Jesus is. Yes, I pray that God uses my words, but at the end of the day, it's God himself which is why he must be the one that's greater. I must, be, I must become less. He's the only one who can reveal to us who it is that his son is. And I love this thought. It says this, your answer regarding Jesus's identity is directly connected to your personal identity. Because as we read on, if you see in, in Matthew chapter 16 there, Jesus then says that Simon, uh, this, is, this, is, this, this was revealed to you by God. And then he speaks to Simon and he says that your name is going to be called Peter. It's going to be Peter. And, and, and upon this truth, this statement that you said, I'm going to build my church. He began to then give Simon Peter an assignment. He began to reveal to him his identity. He began to show him the position and who he was. But Simon learned who he was when God revealed to him who Jesus was. Your identity is directly connected to who you ascribe Jesus to be in your life. There's no delineation. The identity of Christ and your personal identity, the truth of who you are, is forever linked in, 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 irrevocably. There's no way to separate. There's no way to segment. The truth of who you are is rooted in you defining and looking at Jesus accurately for who he is. So as I ask you this most pertinent, this most pressing and important question, who are you? Know that if you answer that in absence of Christ, your answer will only be halfway true and will always be insufficient. Let us look at our identity through the identity of Christ himself. And as we close, I wanted us to uh, revisit one other place in scripture to remember this thought that, man, as I ask who Jesus is, I don't pull it out of thin air. I don't pull it out of secondhand expressions from other people, from friends or family. As we ask who Jesus is, we must look to God himself to reveal the identity of Christ. And at the end of that revelation, we see Simon then received his assignment. He then received what he was supposed to do. I love what John the Baptist said earlier, too, that the success of Jesus is what brings him joy. He was not the main. He's not the main course. He was not the main event. He was not the headliner on stage. He said at the success of Jesus, I receive joy. He must become greater. I must become less. So as we close, I wanted us to leave with some 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 core foundational truths that you can take with you. And I want you to wrestle with them when you are asking yourself, who is Jesus? And the truth I offer is that that is always connected to who you are. How do you answer who Jesus is? It can't just be my word. It should be God's words himself. Colossians chapter one, as we close here in verse 15, it says this. It says Christ. <laughs> it says this. It says Shayla says I always say that. Never mind. OK, I just noticed that time. You see that? But no. verse 15, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. This is the identity of Jesus, the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and he is supreme. Again, 
He must become greater. I must become less. Take these scriptures with you. We're trying to identify Christ, knowing that it's, it will lead to you identifying yourself more clearly. He is supreme over all creation. Verse 17, Colossians chapter 1. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. Christ has always existed. Christ will have no end. He is eternal. He is supreme. He is the visible image of the invisible God. Verse 18, Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. What we do with the church is not up to me. You know, no one else has rule over my body. It, well, biblically, my wife does, but no one else has rule over my body. I have autonomy to operate in the same way that Christ does. He is the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead. Jesus defeated death first. We follow suit as believers in Christ. We follow suit. He's the one that raised first to know this, that our death is not the end he he is the one that we look to to know that our souls will live forever and we will be united back to God he is supreme over all who rise from the dead so he is first in everything Jesus is always first place I love this I told them this is kind of the setup uh, uh, there's some videos that talk about testimonies on YouTube you should check some out if you care to but it says this Jesus is first in everything Therefore, I should always be second. I am second. I don't come first. Jesus is supreme. Jesus should rule. Jesus should be exalted. I should be humbled. I should be less. He should be more. I can never esteem him high enough. Just Jesus will always be in first place. And lastly, verse 19 says, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. Christ possesses the entirety of God himself in bodily form. He is the example we look to. So me, as that timid child holding a basketball uh, with big hoop dreams and so many other aspirations, to know I can be secure because I find identity in who Christ is and he continues to this day for the rest of my life to show me our, to, to show me our, <laughs> to show me who I am, to show me who I am, to show me who I am supposed to become, to show me who I am that is connected to Christ himself and me finding out who it is that I'm supposed to be. So I'll leave you guys just with these two thoughts as we close here today is who are you? Same question I've been asking this entire time. How does Jesus inform your answer to that question. How does Jesus inform your answer to the question of who you are? And lastly, learning more about Jesus reveals more about yourself. People look for self-help. They look for 10 quick steps to identifying my uh, calling or my destiny or my career path. There's no other place outside of Christ that will clearly define who it is you're called to be. He is first in everything because God in his fullness is pleased to dwell in just Jesus alone. We're so excited for uh, so many angles we're going to take on this, so many stories we want you to hear about the impact of Jesus's identity encountering our worlds and our identities being radically transformed by just Jesus himself. So I leave you with that today. Let's think on these questions. Who are you? And how does Jesus inform your answer to that question? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word, for the truths of your word, for the impact of your word. God, as we're seeking to land on our identity of who you have called us to be, God, teach us what it means to have the truth revealed by you to us. I pray for anyone right now wrestling with identity on the other side of this camera. God, might you help them to know you're with them, you're for them, you never are turning your back on them. God, might you reveal to those who are ready to receive who Christ is, knowing that in the revelation of Jesus, 
we truly find identity in ourselves. So for those who have been uh, misinformed by other people about who they are, about what they're supposed to do, about their calling, their destiny, about their character, about their worth or value, God, I pray today that you would re-inform them of the truth that Christ is God and that he loves them and he's called them for a purpose. So I pray for those who know who you are, God, to be uh, reaffirmed, to have stronger roots into the truth of your word. And for those who do not know you yet, God, that they would truly arrive at the only one answer. Christ is supreme. Christ is God. Just Jesus alone is the source of all our hope. It's in your name we pray, Lord God. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for rocking with us. Uh, looking forward to spending this series together with you. Feel free to shoot us any questions, comments, or even if you want to come share your story, man, holler at us. We would love to hear what has Jesus's identity informed your identity to be. See you guys soon. Peace.